Namaste, namaskar, and welcome to the 13th episode of Pustakalak, a discussion on the book From High Risk Sports to Sports as High Risk, Crisis, Capitulation, and Creativity During COVID-19, authored by Professor Sadna Manik. This discussion is brought to you by the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Consulate General of India in Durban, South Africa. Thank you to its director, Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, for this initiative. My name is Tamasha Kanyi, and I will be hosting and facilitating this discussion. Joining us, we have our esteemed guests, Professor Sadna Manik, Dr. Kudsai Sevius Tarasai, Dr. Omar Isao, and Dr. B. P. Singh. We also have Mr. Kieran Singh and Mr. Sipiwe Mkunu. Welcome everyone, and thank you for taking the time to engage in this discourse. We will start by having remarks by Professor Sadna Manik. Professor Sadna Manik is an Associate Professor in Geography Education within the School of Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and she is ranked number one since 2018 through to 2020 in Kata, a sub-discipline of karate in the master's division in South Africa. Her research interests include the internalization of education, teacher mobility and migration and student access. She received an award for her contribution to higher education by the International Women's Club in 2020. She was also ranked in the top 30 most published researchers in 2019 within the College of Humanities at UKZN, and she received an Excellence in Teaching Award in 2018. Also in 2018, she won the Masters Kata in the Karate category at the Arnold Classic Competition in Santon and also became the National Masters Kata Champion after winning the SA Nationals. She has held the ranking of number one in the division of Masters Kata for three consecutive years. Welcome, Professor Sadnaji. Thank you very much, uh, Tamasha. Uh, that was the first time I heard it being pronounced in that way. So it's kata. That's a oh, new kata. twist to the pronunciation. <laughs> yes, kata, kata. And Thanks. the other sub-discipline is komite. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. So this book then is, is a response to COVID-19 and its impact on sporting society. We are all aware that COVID-19 has drastically altered daily life since the beginning of 2020. So it's not unusual that it would actually alter sport. So this publication then provides the scholarly contribution to the very scant literature at that point in time, which was last year, that was available on COVID-19 and sport in Southern Africa. By focusing largely on South Africa and to a slightly lesser extent on Zimbabwe. Uh, both countries have been instituting similar, if not at times, the same social responses to the disease. Since the declaration of the pandemic, there's actually been very limited literature published with this dual focus of COVID-19 and sport in this geographic uh, region. And what has been published has centered on sport tourism, um, which is a huge financial contributor to destinations in Southern Africa. Uh, much research has indicated that sports events have suffered the brunt of lockdown restrictions with travel bans, curfews, and quarantines. Significantly, what has remained unreported is this more localized approach to the impacts of COVID-19 on sport in this context of Southern Africa, um, and tapping into participation and even consumption debates and narratives and in this way, the book then takes this very nuanced approach by mining into this phenomenon of sport within the framing of COVID-19 in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. So we offer theoretical, methodological, and empirical insights using an array of popular sport codes, ranging from low-risk sports to high-risk sports. In fact, all of the chapters in the book are underpinned by this axiom of sport as risk due to the pandemic, a notion which I articulate in, in the editorial as well. The book then offers social, cultural, political, 
and economic insights into the role of sport in, in various levels in society in both countries, South Africa and Zimbabwe. It moves from the micro perspective of the individual to the meso level of, the group, of a group, namely club or community level, and then to the macro level of a nation during the time of the pandemic. For example, the South African focus in the book throws this wide net across individual club and national level sport, covering several sport codes from low to high risk sports. While the Zimbabwean focus covers urban and rural contexts, delving into the impact of COVID-19 for sport in schools and communities that depend on sport as this very crucial part of the school curriculum and even sport events, which sustains livelihoods. The book thus concurrently unpacks the impacts of the pandemic on sports participation and consumption in several codes of sport. The chapters highlight the strengths, the weaknesses and the challenges experienced from several vantage points in sport, athletes, clubs, community, business, etc during the pandemic, uncovering and exposing along the way, sometimes political pandering, socioeconomic inequalities, such as poverty and gender, previously overlooked during pre-pandemic sports commentary. And we also then present arguments in this book for the social transformation in sport. So significantly, the book then provides a critique of selected sport codes, and their pandemic afflictions, providing some creative avenues, physical and digital options in sports participation and consumption, with this view to mitigating the effects of COVID-19 and facilitating a return to some semblance of safe and transformed sports. Um, in fact, in the editorial to the book, I framed the COVID-19 pandemic as a health hazard. And this, of course, is aligned to the presidents of South Africa and Zimbabwe announcing the state of disaster due to the pandemic. Um, the very close relationship between the pandemic and sport is also presented. There's several theoretical shifts in risks and hazards research that's in the scholarship uh, before and during the pandemic. There's also literature on sport, which is presented that has remained focused on health concerns. And one strand has actually shifted from this preponderance of studies across two decades on high-risk sports with a very physiological focus on participants' identity aspects and issues and risks in participation to now this high risk in sport with a very psychological focus with over in arching impacts and fears associated with the coronavirus disease of 2019. So even the nomenclature in sports scholarship has, has changed and this features in the book itself. There are several chapters and um, I think we've got two guests a little later on today who speak about their particular chapters. Um, and I'd like to maybe just speak a little bit about my own chapter uh, in, in the book. So my chapter is titled An Autoethnographic Optic experiences of migration to multiple modes of training and participation in karate during COVID-19. Um, so my contribution then is about training of a ranked athlete and program resilience. It's also about how one would cope during such aberrant circumstances. So there is some kind of input into program risk and resilience. Uh, during this arrhythmic period, such as the pandemic, I take from my own experiences of face-to-face -face remote training before the pandemic and even during the pandemic, and look at ways in which I can maximize participation, not just for myself, but also for the club. Um, and so I argue then in the chapter from a very bifurcated stance of a ranked karateka, but also as an instructor. And I adopt this program risk and disaster management perspective in the chapter. I also evaluate training and the strategies that have been adopted. And I hone in on the digital divide and what it means for continued participation in karate. 
Anna then provides some brief recommendations on the way forward for karate training. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadnaji. We will now have remarks from Dr. Kudzai Sabius Tarasai. Dr. Kudzai Sabius Tarasai is a geographer in the Department of Curriculum Studies at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. He holds a PhD from University of Guazan Natal, South Africa. He also did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Guazan Natal. He has taught geography in Zimbabwe as well as in South Africa. He has researched and published several articles on teacher migration in South Africa and contemporary issues in education. Welcome, Dr. Kudzaiji. Thank you, Tamasha Ji. Uh, let me start by saluting our director for this wonderful opportunity to, to be part and parcel of this panel. I'm grateful for the invitation to join the panel on the discussion on the recently published book by Professor Sadnamanik. Uh, it, is, it was indeed an honor to be part of the great book uh, project, which befits this program, which is the light of a book. Uh, without turning this celebration of a book into an academic lecture, My remarks will focus on three words from the title of the book. Uh, the words are Christ. Uh, these three words are uh, the chapters of the book. Uh, they are not only applicable to the book, they can also be extended to apply to our situation in the world. We are currently going through crisis, capitulation, and creativity in as far as the COVID-19 pandemic is concerned. Uh, however, I'm going to restrict my remarks to the last two chapters in the book. The chapter that I authored with my colleagues, which is entitled The COVID Pandemic and Sport in High Schools, A Case of Selected Schools in Mashingo District, Zimbabwe. Then the other chapter that I'm going to discuss is entitled uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on sporting activities in society in Mutare community Zimbabwe, negotiating a Bambi playground. Basically, these two studies highlight uh, the impact of COVID-19 on sports in high schools, as well as in the community within uh, the selected focus the discussion on a few selected findings that came out from from the studies which are captured on the, uh, in the two chapters uh, the two chapters reflect on the crisis and capitulation caused by covid pandemic in the high schools and society in zimbabwe with a particular focus on sporting activities some of the selected themes from the chapters were number one Sport, uh, there were sports calendar disruptions. The two studies highlighted that within the sporting arena, all the events that, have been, uh, that had been scheduled for from March 2020 up to the end of the year in as far as sporting in high schools and uh, in society in Zimbabwe, they were affected by, by the COVID pandemic. And these results or these findings show that what happened within the high schools mirror what was happening on the international scene. But the challenge that we have is when it comes to sporting in high schools in Zimbabwe, there wasn't any opportunity for rescheduling. Like uh, recently, a few weeks ago, on the international arena, we had uh, Tokyo 2020 Olympi Olympic Games being held in 2021. But in high schools and in society in Zimbabwe, there was no opportunity for that due to uh, logistical and resource constraints. Then from there, uh, the other issue that emerged from the studies was the COVID-19 pandemic affected athletes' fitness. There, wa there was an, a widening of uh, the gap between the fitness of athletes in high schools and those of uh, professional teams in the sense that high school 
sports persons did not have access to gyms and sporting uh, 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 facilities during the course of the lockdown. But we had professional athletes on the international scene uh, doing individual training and so on. So basically, the two chapters in the book published by Prof Manik highlight the widening of the gap between professional athletes and high school athletes. Then from there, the chapters also highlight the fact that COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic had implications, implications on the schools, on the sports teams. Because when the COVID, uh, the, the lockdown was announced, school, schools had already procured sports equipment, uh, sports supplies, and all these supplies went to waste during the lockdown. There are some sports supplies which are perishable, which cannot be stored to be used for, 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 uh, for the next season. So basically there were financial implications in as far as high schools were concerned. Then the second study, which is captured in the last chapter of the book, highlights the fact that the financial implications were felt by soccer players within the city of Ntari, whereby uh, soccer teams were not able to, to, to pay salaries. They were not able to, to, to fund other running costs because of the COVID pandemic. Then, if we add these implications, they lead to another challenge, which is highlighted by the second study, which is captured in the second chapter. There were psychological implications on athletes, players, and business people. I'm going to quote one participant who actually captures the psychological uh, dilemma that they were going through uh, during the lockdown. Uh, open quote, most local league teams are failing to pay, uh, to pay salaries for their players. If you could go through the group chats for the players, you would realize there is anger, uh, frustration, despair, and anguish. So basically, the COVID-19 pandemic had psychological implications which affected athletes, business people, uh, players, and so on. And then, remember earlier on, I emphasized uh, the, 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 that uh, my remarks are going to be uh, around the three words, crisis, capitulation, and creativity. It wasn't all gloomy. It wasn't all uh, negative implications of uh, COVID-19. The last finding that image from the studies was some local authorities, some schools took the opportunity to renovate and uh, sprouse up their, their sporting uh, facilities. Since everything, everyone was under lockdown, the local authorities took the opportunity to renovate their, uh, their, their sporting facilities. So it was an opportunity to improve the sporting uh, facilities. Then the other uh, finding migration uh, to, to the use of technology, whereby some athletes started using uh, devices like uh, app uh, applications like Train My Athlete, whereby a coach would participate in the coaching of an athlete while at least they are separated uh, physically, you know, like uh, it was online training. So these are some of the positives that emerged from the pandemic. It wasn't all gloomy. There were other positives that we are, that are captured in the book by Professor Sadanamanik. As I conclude, uh, it was interesting to note from the list of contributors to this uh, wonderful book, uh, book projects, uh, project rather, uh, we have the editor, Professor Sadanamanik. She's into karate, Dr. Isao, is into chess. Uh, Dr. Tarisai was once a struggling soccer player. So if we look at the names and the people who contributed to this book, there are people who have interest in sports, but they have moved to, to academia. Even if we, if we were to identify even the likes of Eva Joy Nyaradzi, she was in the national team for netball. So these are people who understand who have lived experience uh, in as far as sporting is concerned. 
Uh, lastly, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Sad Namani for this wonderful book project and and uh, the privilege to participate in. Namaste. Thank you very much, Dr. Kudzaichi, for those poignant remarks. We now have the next speaker, which is Dr. Omar Isal. Dr. Omar Isal is a senior lecturer in the Department of Curriculum Studies at Stellenbosch University. His teaching and research are in the fields of teacher education, curriculum development, action research, and multicultural and multi-religious education. He holds a PhD, MED, BED, which is an honors, and Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of the Western Cape, UWC. During his teaching career of 23 years in South Africa, he acted and served as an educator, a head of department, deputy principal, as well as a principal. His master's and doctoral students work more broadly in school improvement and teacher development. In his recent published works, he concentrates on preparing pre-service teachers for the diverse and multicultural classroom and for teaching in COVID-19 and beyond. He is also the Vice President of Chess in South Africa and the Honorary Life President of Schools Chess in South Africa. Namaste and welcome Dr. Omar Isaji. Namaste and thanks for having me on this uh, lovely program. Yes, indeed, it's an opportunity not only to thank uh, our respected Professor Sadana Manik, you know, for, for, for guiding and helping us and assisting us with something which is very timeless. I think, uh, you know, people talk about sport, they talk about COVID, but to put it in on paper and to be able to publish it and show it to the world, it is evidence that people think while they are in, in the remotest part of the world or while they are busy doing their work. So this project, it's all about uh, the writers contemplating and reflecting on their lived experiences and then expanding it and exposing it to the communities and then trying to tell the communities what is really happening. So in my case, you know, this book highlights the influences obviously of the pandemic on sports participation. We do know last year we didn't even have the Olympics. I, I wonder how can a Olympic player really, you know, sort of be at his or her best with COVID-19? We sometimes see here yeah, the rugby team or the cricket team of India is not doing uh, the best. Yeah, and then we're saying uh, something wrong with the player. But we seem to forget that they are all mere human beings and they are engaging in a very, uh, uh, you know, compromised uh, era of society. We are, you know, whether it's the Spanish flu era or whether they're looking at uh, COVID-19, this is something uh, special. So yes, we embrace uh, COVID-19. And yes, how did we embrace COVID-19 with, uh, with this book? We uh, wrote about our uh, um, sporting activities. So in my case, to come to my chapter, the impact of COVID-19 on chess in South Africa. I tried to make it real and I went into the chess fraternity being a part of chess, playing chess since I was four years old. And then obviously I can't beat the grandmasters in India, but more than that, I could, I know what is happening in the world of chess. So in the world of chess, you, you in fact, in sport, you have administrators, you have coaches and you have a, a, a people who sort of withered spectators, you have arbiters who was like referees. All these people were jobless during COVID-19. Sport brings in mammoth amount of money, you know. I mean, if you look at Ronaldo, just for watching him, you know, scoring a goal, it's a mammoth million. So, so you're looking at sport, sport is all about money. Now, when the sporting world comes to a halt, immediately, you find that the coach doesn't need to coach any longer. And, they, and then, of course, uh, the person who made money out of transport even or selling a lollipop at the soccer field, these people are all jobless. So the pandemic hit across the sporting spectrum, whether you are a spectator or whether you are the person selling the lollipop 
or going right on top to the administrators. Uh, I'm not going to go to the bookies and the rookies, but everybody makes money through sport. So when I focus on my code, uh, and I say my code because I'm involved with the code, uh, I address the question of the way the outbreak, uh, the, the, the pandemic, you know, how the social distancing impacted the, the, the code of sport. And while it is uh, chess and it is in South Africa, I am almost definitely sure it's happening all over the world. So chess is an Olympic sport code. So although more amateur in South Africa, it offers benefits across the socioeconomic spectrum in terms of, like I mentioned, administrators, players, coaches, referees. And in this chapter, you know, I write from, a, from my lived experience. So it's an autoethnographic case study, you know, and I use that methodological approach as a lens to see what's happening. So we also organized, you know, as part of this whole process, our own online tournaments to see what's the difference to playing online chess. A lot of people think, oh, chess is online because, uh, you know, these chess fundies, they're always busy with computers and gadgets and digits, and they know that. But believe you me, there's a massive difference playing online and playing over the board chess, face to face. Face to face, I can see whether somebody's copying. You know, if the person is writing exams, I can see whether they're copying. But if it's Online, you can utilize search engines. You can utilize uh, people to help you come write this exam for me or come play for me and then uh, my rating will go up, etc., etc. So this type of crookery can happen during online, you know, in chess. And, and, and this has been proven, you know, that if you play in a short stint, you know, it's a 10 minute game, but if you play in a normal game, you're looking at 90 minutes for your partner or, or your op the, the opposition and 90 minutes for yourself, you will find that uh, crookery can happen in devious ways, whether you go to the toilet. So you must have uh, uh, viewing the, the player, wherever the player is walking or going and all that type of thing and see, like now you can't see what I've got under my desk here or what I've got in my satchel but I can see your face here. So, so it's easy to monitor that. So all this type of crookery and meaning if you win, you're going to win a million rand in a tournament. So can you believe the amount of things that can happen on online? So coming to the, I'm not going through the whole chapter per se, because I also speak about the history of chess in South Africa. I use the opportunity to say how um, COVID-19 also makes the poor poorer. And, you know, those who are at an advantage, they get more advantages during this COVID-19. So when you are somebody that has all the assets, you can, you become a trillionaire. And if you're poor, I don't think you, you stand a chance when it comes to COVID-19 or whether you must stand in a queue for an injection. You're going to have to wait last. So all these type of things I try to bring out in the chapter, you know, that uh, the, 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 the inequalities, so COVID-19 was also an opportunity for us in the world to sort of, uh, you know, lessen these inequalities and to try to bring humanity, you know, make humanity sane. In fact, a lot of people started praying during COVID-19 and they, 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 a lot of people are more close to the, to the creator also during COVID-19. So there's some positives in COVID-19. And I think uh, it's also about the human being, you know, knowing the, the other, the otherness and respecting the other. So whilst we do play chess and engage in sport, it is a way of bringing humanity together and trying to share the suffering of humanity and to make it less. So I think this is the, the, the heartbeat of the sport, of the book, you know, the issue of humanity. Yes, sport is not just about winning. You know, it's all about trying to winning uh, to win over humanity and, and engage with the other. So this is the strength of the book. And I think uh, to a large extent, the, uh, as the gentleman said, the director of the book, she has sort of gained that. She's also, I think the collegiality comes through also where we work together from different universities and we could interact. So the strength of the book is not just that what you see in paper, but it's those emotions that go through in, in, in finishing the book and publishing the book and engaging with the other. So at the end of the day, 
we become stronger human beings and we could, uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I appreciate this uh, Professor Sadata Manik more because of her humanity, you know, and let alone she, she won't appear as she's a fifth dad person. So anyway, having said that, I think uh, I, I, uh, my chapter, of course, it's part of the book and you can engage with it. But more than that, it's all about online play cannot replace over the board play. That is, that is basically what I'm saying because online play, you know, there's lots of things that can happen, but over the board, you know, where the human sees the other human and after a break, we can engage and we can sit with a cup of tea. I think all of us is longing for that. So yes, the recess that we've had, I think COVID-19 was a recess for humanity to assess themselves. It's a good opportunity to love each other more when we see each other again. So I want to conclude there and... Uh, Yes, I just want to thank uh, the host for, for allowing us to engage on this beautiful program and may this program flourish for bringing good tidings and blessings to humanity. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Isaoji. Thank you for also reminding us about the importance of human interaction. And honestly, hopefully things will get better soon and this recess will be over. Our next speaker is Dr. B.P. Singh, author and educator. Dr. B.P. Singh holds a Bachelor of Arts and Honours Bachelor of Arts from UNISA, a Master's of Business and Administration with Buckinghamshire Chilterns University College in the UK via Mancosa, and a Doctorate in Public Administration through UKZN. Currently, he is a Deputy Manager for Policy, Planning, Strategy and Research at the UKZN Department of Sport and Recreation. Welcome, Dr. B.P. Singhji. Namaskar uh, to everyone, our uh, good friends at the Indian Consulate, our esteemed panelists, our online viewers. A special uh, hello to yourself, Ms. Uh, Tomasha Kani, uh, our panelists, uh, Prof. Sadna Manik, uh, Dr. Kutsai, uh, Dr. Omar Esu, uh, my friend, Mr. Sipiram Tunu, and Dr. Yogi of the Swami Vivekananda the Cultural Center. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be part of this erstwhile <laughs> group of panelists, especially when you look at the profile that each of the writers and panelists hold. Um, it actually gives a lot of credence to the nature of the work that we are here to discuss. And it's my privilege and honor to be here uh, to make a few comments, of course, on this piece of uh, academic uh, excellence. Congratulations to the AASBS for the compilation of this research work. And uh, together with the writing itself is the great amount of advisory benefits this work has, not just for academia and for policymakers, but for the public as a whole. So congratulations to all the contributing authors who are experts in their own fields, not only academia, but also the sporting fields that they represent. I'm hoping to add some value to uh, this discussion or the presentation on this book in the sense that my PhD topic has been on communication policy and strategy with the KZN Department of Sport and Recreation. So in some ways we in tune a little bit with the content that we're speaking of. I must also say I'm particularly interested and happy about the autoethnographic, ethnographic style, sorry, uh, of many of the authors and presenters because prior to me doing the PhD with the communication policy and strategy, I had published a piece of writing in 2010, a book called When the Chalk is Down, and it was launched by Professor Jack Whitehead from the University of Bath, who is the world's leading authority on autoethnography. And I attempted my PhD, at least 50% of the way on that, on the book, and then subsequently changed it to, um, you know, a communication policy and strategy. I'm also an ex-educator. So when Dr. Kutsai speaks of schools and the impact of sport at schools, I can relate to that as well. Uh, in beginning my comments, I'd just like to quote Dr. Esu, who cites Creswell in 2014, which says, and I quote, 
autoethnographers must not only use their methodological tools and research literature to analyze their own experience, but also must consider ways in which others may experience similar epiphanies. They may use personal experience to illuminate facets of cultural experience and in so doing, make characteristics of a culture familiar for insiders and outsiders. Hence, my comments on the work that has been published will be more from a literary point of view as compared to content, because we've had the content specialists who've spoken on the pieces here. The issue of COVID-19, yes, the pandemic has affected all of us in various ways. And I think here, the topic deals with the way sport as a fraternity uh, with people like yourselves involved in it, as well as a community and a society has been affected by the pandemic. I think the benefits of sport have been quite adequately espoused. And in a similar vein, these chapters actually talk about the, the negative aspects of COVID on society itself via, of course, the facet of sport. But I think while there've been negativities, I think in each chapter, each of the authors has spoken about the benefits, the silver lining that has come through with the issue of the COVID pandemic, where we've had to think outside the box. Each one has spoken, particularly in their own space, in terms of the various um, sporting uh, fraternities in which they've been involved. The similar impact of sports, I think, as Dr. Esso has indicated, has also been not just for the sports person themselves, but from an economic point of view, to the whole of society, because sport is a catalyst to economic activity in various ways. And of course, in this way, the pandemic has touched each and every one of us, whether we are active sports persons or not. I'd like to quote Prof Manik, who says, and I quote, sport has always been associated with multiple benefits, regardless of a person's age. The pursuit of fitness and part of an appropriate lifestyle for human beings apart from maintaining the harmony needed for the work-life balance. And naturally, yeah, every individual has been affected, as I've indicated, and not just by the issue of sport, but also the issue of recreation. I think coming from the Department of Sport and Recreation, I'm uh, not really a specialist on any particular aspect of sport. But just to say, government today looks at sport and recreation together. Because in the larger sphere of things, you'll find that there are more people involved in recreational sport than professional sport but all are sport. And so when you look at the negative effect of the pandemic, it's cut across the board. And in this way, if you look at all the chapters, they've covered the impact of this on sport in South Africa and abroad, if you look at the issue of Zimbabwe as a case in point as well. So from the content point of view, the book actually covers not just the South African ambit, but it's of worldwide importance because the very principles of the discussion in the chapters pertain to almost every individual at any point in time in every part of the world. This is the new norm. And I think sport has been used as a catalyst to talk about the new norm. I would create a, a place this book as a genre as creative nonfiction because all the chapters have been written firsthand by people that have themselves experienced the sport and of course experienced the impact of COVID-19 on that particular sport. So I like the way in which the presentation has been, because while each of these chapters are, you know, as a precursor have the extract, making this an academic piece, but you find the very nature of the academic piece is broader than that which is written from academia. The content and the manner in which it is written, and if you look here, for example, at Renuka uh, Ramroop and Jessica Singh have written using a narrative format which is very important because from a literary point of view, the idea is to communicate your thoughts as an author and as a creative content. And the mechanism to you know, actually enforce or, or to promote that communication is very, very important. So while we have the academic take in terms of the chapters, we also have the narrative take where the layman, and here I'm talking about the person's street, not involved directly in academia sometimes, is able to relate to the content of the book. In terms of uh, the chapter that delves on the major impact of COVID on the sport industry as a whole, where income generation comes in, and here you have Dr. Sabello, who speaks of the issue of the leisure, the careers, 
The advertising that forms part of the economic hub that centers and relies heavily on sport. If you think of the issue of sport, I would estimate about 25% of our economy is run, you know, in terms of the sport as a catalyst, promoting other forms of income and careers, et cetera. So I think every chapter has underlined and emphasized the major impact that COVID-19 has on us. And as such, while the topic may seem sport, may seem professional, may seem from an academia point of view, placed at one particular corner and away from the rest of the world, in this instance, it is not. I think the association with COVID-19 makes this book pertinent to each and every one of us. It forces us to reflect, and that's uh, what good writing should be about. In terms of the spread and the impact and the effect of this book, yes, the autoethnographic nature of the presentation allows all of us to relate to you uh, authors as people, as academics who know what you're talking about, have done your necessary research and your authorities on the content that you've written. But in the same vein, you're also sports persons in your own right. So as authors, you are writing in an ambit and a space that you're very well favor. And that lends a lot of credence and credibility to the work that you've produced. The chapters I must mention, uh, you know, span chess, fencing, karate, uh, football, women's rugby, and school sport, amongst others. So the, the, the birth of the content is very widespread. And that is why any person reading this book would find their particular niche, that which they relate to, uh, over and above everything else. I think overall, in terms of the themes and the messaging that you're giving out there, what comes through with COVID-19 and sport is the way we as human beings have to learn to adjust our lifestyle to cope with what is current at that point in time. And I think as Dr. Esso has indicated, playing chess uh, via the computer and playing chess face-to-face -face are two different things. But what do we do? How do we relate to the new situation? And I think what comes through here is the adaptability of us as human beings. Our ability to adapt to the new norm, evolution as a coping mechanism. You know, man's evolved uh, <laughs> for decades and decades and a long time and, uh, you know, millennia. And I think COVID-19 has asked us to evolve again. So from a messaging point of view, I think the reader needs to understand. There are certain things in life we have control over, there are certain things we don't. Those of us who love sport will have to find alternate ways to engage in that sport. And hopefully the new way may be a much more enjoyable way. Although we're used to the old and we're hoping that, you know, the old will return. And hopefully it would, but there's no time frame for that. In the same way, I think this book will also relate to policymakers, not just people in government and the departments of, you know, sport and recreation in KZN, but also national, KZN Department of Sport, Arts and Culture. Policy formulation sometimes is a very neutral and unemotional area to be in. But I think with the academic input in this book and the humane input to that very content in the book, it would actually allow policymakers to look more than just the unbiased, uh, you know, mechanical mechanism of policymaking, but also the humane aspect of it. Because at the end of the day, whatever we do as policymakers impacts on people of the society that we serve. Of course, this the conventional approach to promoting sport and recreation, and even Policymakers need to evolve. And I think the book lends a lot to policymakers looking at how it should be involved and would be involved and how people involved in the sport looking at that particular form of involvement. There is a need to engage, to market, and a lot more advocacy in terms of COVID-19 and sport. And I think this book would be a, a great catalyst for discussion at conventions, for presentation to policymakers in government, sport and otherwise, of course. In conclusion, I'd like to say this is an excellent motivational book. It's a personal book. It's a, a story in each chapter about a particular person who's affected by what he or she loves so much and has achieved so much in the particular space of sport. As contributors, the authors have a great expanse in terms of wisdom, of experience, and all the best to the authors and the editors for the future of this text. I think it's a critical piece of work at a very 
crucial part of time in our lives as a society. Namaskar to all of you. All the best. Thank you very much, Dr. Singhji, for concluding this discussion so well. And thank you once again to all of our guests for taking part in this discourse. We will now have Mr. Sipiwe Mkono from the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, who will now render us the vote of thanks. Namaste, Sipiwe. Namaskar. Greetings to all of you. On behalf of Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, at the Consulate General of India in Devon, it gives me a great pleasure today to deliver a vote of thanks on today's episode 13 of the program, Pustakalok, meaning light of the book. Today, we have a very great book discussions by a book that uh, was authored by Professor Sadana Manikji. You know, in this book, uh, uh, they talks about the impact of the pandemic in the high risk spot in South Africa and Zimbabwe. You know, it really, it touches me, you know, because I always just like, uh, I was not dwelling on the spot, but I was dwelling on, on our daily lives when we're destroyed. But now if I take my time and look at the spot, now I fully understand the impact that uh, this pandemic is doing to the families, you know, who were depending on the spots, who were making money through spots. Now I fully understand that those families, you know, they are in serious trouble. So to Sadana Manikji, and the team, thank you, ma'am, you know, for reviving us that, you know, it's true, the sport world, because of this pandemic, it is suffering. It is really true, nobody can deny that. But today, ma'am, I fully understand the impact of this pandemic in South Africa and all over the world. Now, allow me to thank all our panelists, as I mentioned, Professor Sadana Manidiji, who is the author of this book, Dr. Kudzai Savias Tarisaiji, Dr. Omar Esau, and lastly, Dr. BP Singh. For their wonderful remarks, you know, all of them when they were talking, you know, uh, it, whatever they said to me, you know, it found a place in my heart. I, I fully understand and I, I'm, I'm like enlightened regarding the sport in general, to also to all. All of them to Sadana Manikji, Kudzaiji, Isauji, and Bobanji, Danyabat. Thank you very much for taking part on this wonderful program, Pustakalok, episode 13 this evening. To Dr. Chaitanya Prakash Yogi, Director of Swami Vivekananda Kacharat Center at the Consulate General of India in Devon, Tamasha Kanyiji. Kiran Singhji, thank you very much for taking part on today's program. To all our online participants, we'd like to say thank you for taking part on today's program. We are kindly advised to visit ICCR Facebook page for all cultural updates organized by Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center in Durban. Once again, to Sadana Manikji, Kudzaiji, Isauji, Babanji, Danyaba. To all of you, have a wonderful evening. Namaskar.